I'm Michael Murphy. I work for Board Day and the Irish Food Board. And Board, Board Day is a government agency uh, responsible for promoting uh, trade promoting Irish food and drink around the world. We're about 100 people spread across uh, nine locations as well as Ireland. So we've about 30 people abroad. So it's quite quite thin on the ground if you're talking about the 50 people that the Agio or Guinness had at one stage in Germany. We have uh, quite a small staff around the world. Uh, so basically we try to concentrate on those areas that can deliver the best return for food and drink producers in Ireland uh, and, and the revenue to the state. What I'd like to talk to you today, and really what I, my objective here today is to maybe share some information with you, but more importantly, I'd like some feedback. We've always talked about the 3,000 or 5,000 Irish pubs around the world and how we could work with them, but we found it difficult in terms of how we could put something genuine in place that would return, give a decent return on investment. And I suppose we were delighted when Enda came along with the concept of Irish Pubs Global. At least we could identify how many pubs were around the world, how we could communicate with them, and maybe then move on to doing things jointly uh, with them. So really what I'd like to do is to share some insight into the Irish food and drink industry that might stimulate some thought, and really get some feedback on how we should approach this going forward, is what I'd like out of it. I think time is not on our side, so if I skip through some slides, particularly in the first part of the presentation, it's really the last piece, it's our mission and approach that probably I'd like to give more time to. In terms of Irish food and drink exports, Ireland exports um, 7 to 8 billion of food and drink. It's the most important industry within the Irish, indigenous industry within the Irish economy. It's responsible for about 10% uh, of employment, uh, over 10% of uh, exports out of the country. So very important, and very important at the current time while we're trying to recover uh, and build, build the economy. The key segments of our exports are meat and dairy, accounting for nearly 60% or over 60% of our total exports. But beverages, as we have talked about, is a key part of that and a key part in terms of branding. Prepared foods are very important. It's probably the area you, you know probably less about seafood and also hard. And I'm going to touch on some of those later in the presentation. Where does Irish food and drink go? Naturally, you'd expect uh, Britain is our biggest market. 44% uh, of Irish food and drink goes into Britain. And that's not because uh, we don't want to export to other places, but uh, there are a number of factors. There's common language, common cultures to some degree, and there is a deficit within the British market for food. So it, proximity plays a big role. The areas that, that are increasing are other EU into the continent of Europe. Uh, in terms of international, the areas that are increasing are the United States and uh, China. Within, within, within those two areas. But over time, you'll start to see uh, a not a reduction in the volume put into Britain, but as our exports increase, the proportion of, of dependence on Britain uh, will, will come down. I'll skip through the prospects, other than just say to you, the food and drink industry has been through a, a torrid two years. Uh, 2008 and 2009 were very difficult years. They were the first two years we've had a reduction in, in, in exports. And that was primarily, the biggest factor was not the global recession, but was the uh, reduction in value of sterling, with 44% of your exports going into that zone, and also the reduction in value of the dollar. Uh, we actually exported the same amount, but got less for it. Uh, and that put huge pressures on the food and drink industry in Ireland. But what I'd say is, the food and drink industry in Ireland is stronger as a result of it. They've managed to uh, tighten up costs, to take co costs out of the system, add value to it, and I would think they're in a far better position to supply markets they wouldn't have had in the past. In terms of Board Bia, uh, we're a government agency, but we're slightly different than, than that. We have a board of directors which are run by the food and drink industry. So we take our cues from the food and drink industry, both farmers and producers. Of it, and basically, the strategy is devised by by those boards. We would like to say, see that we are very uh, open to what's going out, happening to our customers. We like, to, you know, to feel that we are in touch with with customers and with the clients. So we are on top of what's happening in the food and drink industry, and are able and nimble enough to react to those trends within it. I'm not going to go through the strategy, but if I were to kind of summarise it in two two places, we would see over the next ten years that the Irish food and drink industry moves to a new place. It moves to a place where we are considered well, to have the best systems of production and safety and traceability in the world, but also that we have a far more efficient industry that is acting in unison 
And the third element of that is that we build the brand, which is Ireland, uh, at trade level first, that it is recognised as one of the greatest sources of food and drink in the world, and uh, that its capability is recognised. That's a process we're going through in terms of working with industry to, to build that. And just maybe one element of that is recognising what's going on in terms of global warming around the world. Food, food security is a big issue. It's probably going to be the biggest issue of the 21st century. Uh, and we're going to be, uh, by 2050, we're going to have to produce 70% more food than we do today to feed uh, the population. Ireland is in a unique position. We've got an asset. We export 85% of the food we produce. We're in a position where we have got a huge resource, and it's about how we make that resource work for the country and add value to the country in terms of its brand, in terms of it, 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 how it works. One of the key investments we're making at the moment is we're moving some of our quality schemes to be sustainable schemes. That not only can we say we're a green island, we can say we can prove that our sustainability systems are superior to other competitors around the world. That the carbon footprint or the carbon uh, input into our food and drink is uh, better than, than others. And we are uh, responsible citizens where we're actually moving to reduce that impact around the world. That's just one of the initiatives and we would believe we're probably the first uh, <coughs> national agency in the world to take that on. Companies have taken on, but as, as a country, to take that on is, is a huge step. Uh, I talked a bit about the broadening export reach, and I'm going to skip through a couple of slides. Just to take our biggest, one of our biggest exports is Irish beef. Uh, we have nine out of every ten cattle, and I, our previous speakers were talking about cows, uh, is exported out of Ireland. We have, in terms of, we have a huge resource in, in our beef industry. And over the last 10 years, and maybe because of BSE in the, in the 1990s, we've moved to a, a new position in terms of the profile of, Irish, of customers of Irish beef around the world. I, I, to say now, Irish beef is sold in more supermarkets, in more countries, than beef of any other origin. And that's on, on more supermarket shelves. Because over that period of the last 10 years, we moved from a position where we supplied 21 key retailers across Europe, where we're now supplying more than 80 across Europe. McDonald's in Europe uh, take 20% of all the beef they serve in Europe comes from Ireland, because our safety systems and our quality systems are superior to our competitors. So we have got, in Holland, we have got 15 Michelin star chefs publicly endorsing our product because they believe it's the best in the world. We've got a lot to do to spread that message in a wider audience, and hopefully, in partnership with, 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 with pubs around the world, we can actually help you add value to your business by making it a destination uh, to get, get this great product. So there, there's a lot, there is some very positive things happening there. In terms of our resources, I, as I mentioned, we're in nine locations around the world, so we're very much a trade organization. We work very well with big companies whereby we can sell the message with the Cisco's of the world, with the Tesco's of the world, with the metros of the world, to bring it. Where we probably don't work so well is working with independent operators like yourselves. And we'd like to think, how can we actually make that work better uh, by working together within that area? To give you a, a feel for where we have strategies by each of the products we produce. So the key strategy on beef is very much about uh, building presence in Holland, uh, Italy, and Great Britain. That there are three most important markets on the beef front. And then on all our countries within Europe as well, where we believe we will get a higher return on investment in Irish beef. Outside of Europe, the key places we're working on is uh, particularly Asia in terms of access for product into uh, China and Japan, because there are certain cuts of meat in those countries they'll pay more for than we will pay for within the, in the Western world. Likewise, if we could open up the United States, uh, and at the moment, uh, the United, we believe the United States to be one of the most protective markets to imports of agricultural products in the world. Uh, if we could open it up, uh, there is definitely a market for natural beef within the United States that we could tap into. In terms of something like lamb, I get requests for why can't I get lamb, Irish lamb in Japan. It's very difficult because the demand in Europe is for, the Europe imports lamb. So the, we can, it's very hard to compete with the New Zealanders in Japan on price because Europe is a higher price market. So we're not going to ever get significant supplies of Irish lamb in, in that part of the world. There are probably some niche opportunities again outside of Europe in, in, in North America and maybe the Middle East. 
in something like pig meat, again, it's very much a continental European uh, strategy. Uh, it's, it's really um, something that, that, that we, we find very hard to, to make something like Irish bacon and sausage work within the United States. There are a number of people doing something like uh, an Irish style product within the United States, and it's how we could make that happen. There are companies that have tried it and haven't been able to make it work uh, financially, people like Galti and others. And it would seem that there is a demand there, but we haven't been able to find the cost-effective route to get it to market. Uh, moving on through some of the other areas, uh, <coughs> I said I'd come on to prepared consumer foods, and maybe there's a bit of learning here, here, here within this. In terms of prepared consumer foods, some Irish companies have made massive strides. If you take something like uh, Goodfellas Pizza in Britain, it is an, a, 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 an Italian-American concept. It's the number one brand in Britain, and it's produced in Nace. Uh, because, and it's something you wouldn't uh, expect to be happening. There are other products uh, like that. If you take something like cheese strings, again, it's a, a product that is doing very, very well in the United Kingdom, in, in, in France, in Holland, likely to move into Germany. It's a kid's cheese snacking product, leading, uh, I would believe, in the world in that product. And again, it's made in, uh, by, by uh, the Kerry Group uh, in Cork. Again, products you don't, that may not even have an Irish identity, but are doing very, very well within that. So again, within prepared foods, 80% of that's going into Britain. We are working that into uh, the continent of Europe and, and, and further afield uh, over time. What's happening here? In terms of dairy and dairy ingredients, Kerry Gold, you're all probably very aware of, but doing great, making great strides in North America and also in Germany in particular, where I think the brand is universally available within those countries. We're going to see an expansion of probably 50% in the supply of dairy products out of Ireland over the next 10 years. And the key areas that we are, we've identified for growth there are on the cheese side into uh, continental Europe and on the dairy ingredient side into, into Asia. And to give you a fact, 15% of all infant formula uh, produced in the world is produced here in Ireland. Uh, you know, we're, we're one of the leading producers of infant formula in the world and it's the one product in terms of safety that nobody will compromise on. And that's because Abbott, Wyatt, and the big global multinationals have said, we want to put our production facilities in Ireland because there's a source, uh, a safe and, and sustainable source of, of product. So those, but within something like farmhouse cheeses, which uh, have made their ways into, into various uh, pub menus, those are fantastic for us in terms of building the reputation of Irish food and drink around the world, whether that's in, in North America or in the United Kingdom or, or further into Europe. And I think there are definitely products there that we could work on. There are a number of producers who you hopefully enjoy the delights of outside, uh, the people like Ballymaloo, like Loch Lands, like Attenry, uh, who would love to be able to supply into your businesses abroad, but the cost of getting the products there are very, very difficult. And even just to give you a concept, something like a, a jar of Ballymaloo relish, leaving a, a, a facility here in Ireland, nearly becomes 400% more expensive by the time it gets on a shelf in the US. Because most markets require an importer, a distributor, a broker, and there's a whole lot of and a retail margin to get there. We need to find more efficient ways to get it to you so that you can actually uh, make that work in, in it. And we have some ideas on that. Seafood, likewise, seafood uh, within Ireland is highly recognized as a great industry. But again, in a global sense, our key markets are on the western seaboard of, France, uh, of Europe, and even within Spain, which is our biggest market, we have a market share of 2% uh, in, in most areas. The, the, the global demand is, is huge within, within that area. We, we picked up some benefit from the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, on certain shellfish, uh, the demand from the United States to, uh, to play a part in that, but largely uh, the demand for those products is coming from the continent of Europe. <laughs> In terms of Board B and how we might work with uh, going forward, alcohol has been very successful into the Irish pubs globally, uh, and particularly the big brands like Guinness, uh, Jameson, Bailey's. The secondary brands, the Coolies and others, have found it more challenging with it, with, to access those, those chains, but largely that's been very, very successful. And while we talked about the great success of Guinness, something like Jameson at the moment is the fastest growing uh, whiskey in the world. 
and I think the big growth is coming. It's grown more than double digit in the United States in the last two years, which have been, I suppose, coincided with a global downturn. Again, growing very, very, very well and great um, energy behind it. Bailey's, again, one of the top selling liquors in the world uh, and likewise growing. But why has Irish food done less well into your business? We believe it's because the fragmented nature of business is trying to get that into it. It's easier to supply into a Tesco, which, is, which handles the supply chain, uh, than it is. It's getting distributors, and getting distributors to uh, buy the product and stock it, they will only do that if it's selling in, in quantities that they can make money out of. It's about the chill chain, and a lot of our products being chilled, uh, and ensuring that's a costly way of getting product in certain areas. And I think it's also knowledge of understanding uh, who the customers are and how to get the product there. And it's lo looking at, at some ways we could work on that going forward. In terms of, we have worked with uh, Irish pubs abroad through award systems, through uh, providing backup on recipe cards in Germany, working with people like O'Neill's in Britain and Cavanaugh's in terms of designing their menus. But I don't believe we could say that it's, it's working uh, brilliantly on that. And maybe it's also because other routes to market have delivered better return on, on investment. And it's how do we make that piece work? One of the areas we have explored with, with Enda and Kira from Irish Pubs Global has been providing information through the Irish Pubs Global website. And the first example of that is we've looked at the German market, which has got a very uh, strong uh, I suppose, representation of Irish pubs, but also we believe we've got good sources or routes to market. And this is just an example of putting up all of the sources of where you can get Irish, Irish food and drink and what you can get in the various different locations or with the various different customers. This is taking one particular customer, taking the products that they, they have and where that is actually located. So if you're going into a metro in Germany to do other business, you know you can pick up the Irish beer there as well at a cost-effective price that can work within your business. So in terms of going forward, um, our amb ambition is that we would like to work with Irish pubs around the world in building the Irish image of Irish food and also working with you to build your, uh, I suppose, your business by supplying it. So that there's a give and take within that that we'd like to work, that there has to be benefit for both parties in this, that if uh, by actually choosing and identifying Irish products on your menu, that that can actually build your business. And there are plenty of examples of how that has happened. And uh, Brian Fallon, who's coming after me, will actually be able to demonstrate in real life how that has worked for his business in terms of uh, sourcing and making ingredients within menus a key part of, 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 of his brand. We'd like to go forward in terms of working with Irish Pubs Global. We would like to see Irish Pubs Global uh, or benefit and prosper as, a, as a, an entity in terms of one, uh, identifying those pubs around the world and having accurate records of where they are, uh, providing us the platform to communicate in terms of what's available, in terms of supporting it with recipe cards, with menu development which work and supply a, a gross profit on ingredients of you know 60% plus that we can kind of think and help your business in that, provide you with opportunities to purchase and also where it's mutually beneficial to, to work and see if there are promotions we can do together within that. So I suppose my ask here today and the reason I'm here is I'd like your feedback on is the German, the approach we're taking within the German market of trying to identify and constantly update where you can get Irish products. Uh, is that something we, we are, we do plan to roll that out across all markets. Uh, how we could better uh, tap into the network of Irish pubs and, and how we could play, work with you on that. And uh, you know, is there a pro an opportunity where we can actually work on a country level with a group of pub owners to see how we can pull Irish product through your distributors? So that if we're looking at uh, uh, an, an, an outfit in, in France that is, is a distrib distribution chain, can we actually uh, have our office in France start to liaise with some of the pub owners so that when we're actually making the pitch in there, we can also have you follow up with inquiries about how you could get that Irish product and how that might work in your business. We, that may be able to benefit both of us by pulling those products through the system. So that's a quick run on. I hugely appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you today. I, I would like to thank 
those who have been able to support Irish food and, and support Irish drink uh, continually within that and to see what, what are the opportunities where we might be able to, to work together. I don't believe it's, it's working as well as it could at this point in time. The next session, a uh, time permitting, will be uh, Brian Fallon giving you the, I suppose, the operator's uh, experience on the ground of working with Irish food and drink, and Maura Duffesey from uh, Bordea, who's a regional demonstrator, has uh, some, I suppose, concepts that might work within your business, uh, which Time Eleven will demonstrate as well. So thank you very much for your time, and um, I look forward to seeing how we can work in the future.